Hello, Winfield. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today. My spirit's willing, but my body is weak. It's really weak. Even breathing is hard. So, instead of me coming to you, I'm speaking to you today from my backyard. I'm also speaking to you from a place of tremendous vulnerability. Let me explain it to you this way. Imagine a little, a, a little drake, a little drake, about seven years old. He's on the high dive at the pool. Not the 10 foot high dive, the 10 meter high dive, the Olympic high dive, the one that's three stories up of steel and platform. I've crawled trembling out to the edge of the platform to peer at the pool below. And to my horror, I found that the pool is empty of all water. Why I'm there, I don't know. But my father is standing at the edge of the pool, looking back up at me affectionately. And not merely my earthly father, my heavenly father. The one who is love and wisdom and goodness and beauty. Little Drake is terrified, but my heavenly father, he's not. He calls out to me, little Drake, you can do this, jump. And I blink in disbelief. Wait, what? Surely I've misheard him. And yet, because I know his character and because I've come to believe in his love for me, I holler back reluctantly. If you fill the pool, I promise I'll jump. This seems to me to be courageous, given my present terror. And it's a promise I intend to keep, but only if my father first fills the pool. His reply is warm and inviting, but it puts ice in my veins. He says, Little Drake, I love you too much for that. Your promises, Little Drake, are too small, and your courage is too fragile. It's best if I make the promises, and you take the action. And then he says, Jump, and I promise I will fill the pool. So here I am. And indeed, I have jumped. Oh, oh boy, have I jumped. And I'm somewhere, somewhere mid dive or what appears to me to be a still empty pool. But I'm not looking at the concrete. Not the concrete below, well, I'm looking at the face of my Heavenly Father. And I'm swallowed up by his delight and his love for me. This is an interesting place to be in life and a provocative place from which to speak to you. But it is where I am. As you know, Winfield, for the past 17 months, my body's been dying slowly. I'm in the grip of a disease which I'm told is untreatable and unstoppable. I've become fully disabled and mostly paralyzed and doctors have assured me that given enough time that the disease will make me fully paralyzed, in fact paralyzed unto death. It's a bad place to be. It's a sucky place to be and yet my predicament does not match my father's face, his countenance, his delight in me. All around me, they're, they're, everything's declaring death. Death, death, death. <laughs> and yet, my Heavenly Father looks at me and says, life. This is a clash between reality and truth, an epic clash between reality and truth. A clash that has torn me apart and remade me. I'm not the same person I was when I came up on this high dive 17 months ago. I've been transformed. I've been transformed by faith. A faith that seems to most to be either absurd or pitiful or offensive. 
but I'm telling you the truth. I'm not afraid. I'm falling towards the bottom of a concrete pool, and I'm not afraid. The purpose of this video is to help you understand why. Mm. Uh, so I'm not afraid. Why? Well, the answer is not Christianity. At least not the Christianity I've practiced for the majority of my life. The one that worships a silent God who offers eternal life to nice people who spend their lives believing in the historical Jesus and condemning those who don't. Wow. What I just said was harsh, wasn't it? But isn't that the brand of Christianity my generation has promoted? Isn't that what we've offered to you? Think about the Christianity we see lived out all around us in our world today. For the most part, it's political, it's religious, it's hypocritical, it's judgmental, it's uninspired, and quite frankly, disappointing. I know because I lived in it. Now don't get me wrong, there are bright spots with bright people who are truly living out the brilliance of the gospel, and some of them are among you even now. But these are small islands in an ocean of cultural Christianity. There exists a disturbing gap between what we read about in the New Testament, the brightness of the lives of the saints in the New Testament, and the dullness of our own souls. We pretend like it isn't there because after all, we have the gospel. We have God. We have right doctrine. We have correct theology. We have right answers. We belong to a, holy, to a holy huddle. But what do we really have? I mean, really. Really. Let me tell you what I had three years ago. It was a form of religion that was fracturing the weight of life. I had a distant Heavenly Father who I did not who had learned about, but I did not really know. Oh, I knew he loved me because the Bible told me so. But I didn't know that he loved me. I didn't know. I did with that deep kind of knowing that can either be shaken or rattled. And Jesus, Jesus was a ticket to heaven. He had done something significant for me historically. I didn't know what to do with him now. I didn't know where he was at now or who he was, except try not to disappoint him. And the Holy Spirit, oh man, the Holy Spirit was a mystery. And within that fragmented trinity, I was left with my head on a swivel, looking backward towards a historical Jesus, forward to a hope of a future heaven with a father I barely know, and up, down, and all around for a Holy Spirit who eluded me. That kind of Christianity caused a crisis of faith in my life three years ago. I'd come to an honest and dangerous place realizing that either Christianity was a fraud, or I was a fraud, or we were both frauds. You can hear it in the words of a letter that I penned. I wrote this to God in 2015. It was a full year before I knew I was sick. Listen to what I wrote. Holy Trinity, you see me, the real me, the true me, feeble and flabby, prayerless, worn out and weary from half-heartedly rowing against the wind and the waves while going nowhere. Oh, I need your help. In the fourth watch of the night, your Holy Spirit whispers hope of a further journey. Come, get out of the boat and follow me. But the wind is too loud to hear what you are saying, and the sea is so dark and so heavy and full of drowning. I will die if I go, and I will perish if I stay. I cannot stay in the boat. I will not get out of it. The whole thing is urgent, confusing, and deadly. You are not inviting me to walk on water, are you? You are asking me to come and die. I am like a peasant villager who received an invitation from a king of a distant land who cherishes the invitation and proudly shows it to his friends, who frames it and hangs it over his mantle, who tells and retells the story of when he got the invitation. And who, and who holds a place of honor in the village for what he has received. But he never actually leaves home to go on the journey, never takes to the open road, never beholds the wonder and the beauty and the danger of the great adventure. 
and who therefore never meets the king. He is like a Frodo who never leaves the Shire, like a Skywalker who stays on Tatooine, like a Peter who remains with his fishing nets. I fear this commonplace tragedy, this wide road that leads to destruction. O oh Lord, your call is clear. Come and die that you might truly live. My life replies, I can't, I won't, I must. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I must get out of the boat. It is no longer safe for me here. I fear the captain of the sea more than I trust the captain of this vessel. Tepidly, Drake. Who? Do you hear it? Do you hear it in the words of my letter? Do you hear my angst, my crisis of faith, my crisis of identity? I had an awareness that I was living fraudulently, and yet I had a place of honor inside cultural Christianity. I was the head of a Christian school. And who was this king of glory that dared to call me out upon the waters? Little did I know then, but I was about to be thrown into, into the furnace of affliction with flames so hot that they would burn away all that was false and all that was flimsy and all that was fraudulent. I would perish along with my flimsy Christianity or a truth hotter than the flames themselves would have to prevail. December 7th, 2016 is the date that Betsy and I refer to as our descent into darkness. It was the day that we learned that something was seriously and terribly wrong with my body and probably terminal in nature. The next six weeks were horrible. Uh, I felt like there was a heavy, thick blanket of dread had soaked in death that had been cloaked across our whole lives. I don't remember any light and the, and the Christianity that I championed seemed entirely inadequate and insufficient in the grip of such a terrible disease. I was out of the boat but I was not walking on water. I could not see Jesus. I was drowning to death in a sea of fear. In church, we often sing songs about surrender, and I'm pretty sure we have no idea what, we're, what we are really singing about. We sing about surrender as if it's a painless posture, as if it costs us nothing, as if it is unrelated to Jesus' command to come and to follow him to take up our crosses daily. What we sing about is a deathless surrender, a happy surrender that keeps us in control but gives God's a nod of deference and a wink of affection in the hopes that he'll continue to bless us. But suffering, real suffering of soul and body, it has a way of producing a much deeper and truer surrender, one that may cost us everything. It was this kind of surrender that I was experiencing six weeks after my descent into darkness. Uh, it was Winter Mountain. It was Winter Mountain 2017. And I was awakened in the middle of the night and just felt compelled to go out to the living room of my, of my cabin, get down on my knees and, and, and bow before the Lord and pray in earnest a very simple prayer. One like this. Hear all my fears, Lord, and here are all my hopes. Here am I, Lord. Take me, and may I be according to thy word. I don't know where that prayer came from. I hadn't heard it before or prayed it before. It was short and simple, and yet it was deeply profound, as if it came from my soul rather than from my rational mind. I knew then, in some honest way, I would perhaps i perhaps surrendered to God for the first time in my life. And whatever, whatever he chose to do or not do, whatever he chose to speak or not speak into existence, that would be my reality. I'd given myself into the hands of the God who I knew about, but maybe I really didn't know, and yet desperately needed. What I didn't expect is that that God would actually speak he talked back. I didn't expect that. 
rapport that he would actually communicate to me personally and in a way that I could see, could understand and, and know that it was him. But he did. He did. And this is how it happened. So the week after Winter Mountain, I was at a conference in, in Orlando, Florida. And uh, on the plane and in the hotel room, I've been reading Psalm 71. Psalm 71 is a beautiful psalm of hope and of promise. And I read it that morning before going to breakfast. Um, and that morning, verses 20 through 21 in particular, just made my heart heave with hope. I didn't, I didn't presume that God was speaking to me or saying anything to me personally. Um, he was speaking generally. He was, you know, it was, it's what Christians do. We, we, we read our Bibles and we, we hear things as if, you know, they're for all Christians at all times and all people. And, and that's just how I'd learned to read my Bible. So I didn't think it was for me, but at breakfast, um, my world got rocked. I was introduced to a, a woman from Indonesia, a stranger, and, and listen to how that conversation went. This, this, this is what, this is the exchange. So she said to me, um, "It's nice to meet you, Drake. How are you today?" And then, in this really weird, surprising moment of honesty, I responded with, "Well, I feel like Satan is trying to kill me, and I want to live." And she, she, she like started going, oh my, oh my, oh my, I have something from the Lord for you. And she began to dig around in her purse and she paused and showed me, um, she has goosebumps on her arm. She's like, she said, see, I have God bumps. <laughs> and uh, she, she was reaching in her purse to pull out her phone. And yet even before she pulled it out, I knew, I just, I just knew. I knew in some way that I, I don't know how I knew. I just knew that she was going to pull out Psalm 71. Um, but what happened was even more amazing than that. She did pull out Psalm 71, but she pulled out the specific verses, verses 20 through 21 that were on my heart that morning. The verses that I said, man, I wish those were for me. The stranger had just pinpointed the very place in the Bible that I, that I was at that the, that very morning. Here's what those verses say. It says, "You," which is the the psalmist is writing to God. So, Lord, you have made me see many troubles and calamities. You, you have made me see many troubles and calamities. You will revive me again from the depths of the earth. You will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and you will comfort me again. So what do you do with that? Was that a coincidence? Was that some kind of impersonal force in the universe? Some kind of synchronicity, law of attraction? Or was it God? God himself speaking to Drake. This strange combination of scripture and, and spirit and, and the voice of a stranger it was extraordinary and it rattled all that I had believed was true about God see I'd grown up believing that uh, God spoke he doesn't speak but he spoke once upon a time he doesn't speak now he spoke he spoke in the past and we wrote it down we have a Bible and yet to my amazement this God who seemed so far away and so silent had in an instant drawn near and he'd spoken light into my darkness I would describe I would call this this encounter with God my first step out of Christianity as I had learned it and into the kingdom as Jesus taught it uh, so, so it it begs some questions for us to actually ask. What if this kingdom is real? I mean, really real, as in it exists now. Not as a religion and not as an idea or a concept. <laughs> <coughs> or as make-believe or as a fantasy. 
but as truth, as ultimate reality. What if? What if, though unseen, this kingdom is as solid as the chair I'm sitting in right now and shines brighter than the fire? A realm that crosses over between heaven and earth, one in which there is a divine king, a man who is Christ, who reigns and rules with the authority of Almighty God. And what if this Almighty God really is a good father, a good father, a good father who loves us and knows how to give good gifts? And what if the mission of the divine king is to restore humanity back into relationship with this good father? And what if the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, really does move in and around us not just in the extraordinary religious moments of life, but in the ordinary moments, all the time, all around. And what if the Bible, what if the Bible was the Word of God, like the Word of God? And what if there are real spiritual beings called angels, whose loyalties lie with the Divine King, and they war in some cosmic clash against spiritual enemies of that are called demons. What if that battle were real? That clash was real. It was really happening right now in some mysterious, profound, supernatural way. And what if you and I, what if we too are spiritual beings caught up in the midst of an epic holy war of cosmic proportions? And what if we are blinded by our sin and desperate for mercy and grace and confused about who we are? And what if all of this is unfolding, not in some faraway place, but in a real realm that is all around us like a glove on a hand? What if prayer is truly a two-way conversation, a two-way conversation between us and the Divine King, between Him and His beloved people? And what if prayer, what if prayer really does have the power to move mountains because the king has the strength to move mountains for his people. Does that sound fantastic? I would humbly suggest to you that that is the world of the Bible. And it's a reality I've come to believe in. Not with just my mind, not just with my intellect, but with my whole heart. I'm learning to live with it, not because the Bible tells me so, but because throughout this last year, I've experienced it. I've experienced it in profound ways, in mysterious ways, time and time and time again, in startling ways. Not just a single instant, but a tapestry of wonder. It has been woven together in the most extraordinary way that I can't even explain. Psalm 71 was not the only gift I received that week in February. That same week, that same week, the Lord was trying to press into me a Psalms 91, another awesome psalm. And um, I was perplexed. I was asking my friends before church, like, is this how God speaks? Does he bring scripture to us through his spirit? And I went to church that day and a complete stranger walked up to me during the middle of the service, during worship songs were going on and he, this elderly gentleman, this old guy, grabbed my arm and in a gruff voice, he seemed almost kind of annoyed, um, he says, I have a word of the Lord for you. So he pulled me down because I was taller than him so I could hear him. He yelled in my ear, Psalm 91, it's for you. Read it every day. That's literally what he said. Psalm 91 is for you. That was my question that, well, that morning with my friends. Could it be that Psalm 91 is, is, is for me, that God's saying this psalm over my life? And then an old guy, a stranger in church, Psalm 91, it's for you. Wait, what? Is this really happening? I was being awakened to the ways which God speaks through his scripture, through his spirit, through his saints. It was fantastic. Uh, it 
And then it got weirder and more wonderful. I, I've dreamed dreams, vivid dreams, that have come, become undeniable reality. That's never happened to me before. I've been in public, out in public, and strangers have approached me and have prayed prophetically over me and powerfully over me. I've, um, I've sensed the clash of, of real spiritual warfare around me. And I've come to discern the, the presence of friend or foe in the unseen realm. It's real. It's really happening. While praying, there was one time I was praying the phrase, Heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. It was a phrase I, I don't know where I picked it up at, but I'm, I'm praying in my office at Linfield. Heal me and I will be healed. Pray, save me and I will be saved. And my Bible is open to Isaiah 42. And while my eyes are closed, I hear mysteriously like a breeze was blowing the pages of my Bible and flipping the pages. And when I opened my eyes, I was in Jeremiah 17. And uh, I was just going to take a left and go back to Isaiah 42, and then my eyes fell on a verse that said, Heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. The pages of my Bible were turned to the verse that I was praying. And I've seen Bible, vice, Bible, Bible verses in my mind that I did not know. I've had a vision of Christ that I cannot deny. In a moment of great despair, this one time, in a moment of great despair, I was riding my car in total silence and was startled to life. My wife and I both, Betsy and I both, were riding in silence and uh, our radio just came on loudly by itself. That's never happened before. There's nothing wrong with my radio. It's boom. It's on. And through, the, and through the radio comes these lyrics from a, a song I'd never heard before. It says, Come and be fearless. Come and be chainless. Come to the foot of Calvary. For there is redemption for every affliction at the foot of Calvary. What do you do with that? What do you do when, when God turns on your radio? And I've prayed in a language I do not know, and, and I've cried out to God to touch my life. I remember this one time I was crying out, God, touch my life, touch my head, and make me well. And while I'm praying, I get a text from a stranger. I'm praying for the hands of Christ to touch me, and I get this text from a stranger that says, I don't even know who this person is, I don't know who texted it to me, but the text said, he's got you in his hands. I've been delivered, guys. I've been delivered in an instant from strongholds of sin that had me in prison for decades. You know, those sins you cannot shake, that um, plague you with shame, in an instant. I've known truth that I have not learned. I've asked God for my true identity, like, tell me who I am. And he's answered. I've cried out in agony, deep agony, and wept tears of sheer glory. I've drawn near to the Holy One and learned his name and how to hear his still, small voice. Does all that sound weird? Yeah, it is. It is weird. It's blowing my mind. And in doing so, it's destroying the quaint, tidy version of Christianity I believe for so long. I've kept a record of all these things, of all these things that I cannot explain, the things that undeniably bear the fingerprints of God. And that list right now, that list comprises a document that is currently 23 pages long. And what's most remarkable to me is that all of it all of it is God initiated I haven't chased it I haven't contrived it I haven't 
I'm not, I'm not chasing experiences. 23 pages of God coming towards me. This is the tapestry that I'm talking about. It's all around us. It's, it's the kingdom, it's beauty and it's chaos. It's peace and it's war and it's, it's confusing, it's messy. And the center of it all, the center of all of this stands the divine King. Jesus Christ and he's the one he's my Lord I don't believe this is a Drake thing I don't believe this is just for Drake and or just for somebody who's suffering as I am I don't believe the kingdom is put on hold until you're afflicted like it's not available I don't even believe I'm special I believe that Jesus when he said in the scriptures repent because the kingdom of God is at hand I think he meant it in other words I think he was saying change the way you think change the way you see reality because the truth which is greater than reality is at hand and this invitation this invitation to live to see and to live in, inside the kingdom it's for you too in fact, I believe it is for your generation. You must. You, you, you have to dare to go beyond the Christianity that my generation has offered you, the one that we've given you. You must go beyond it. This is the same journey that I've been on, and it's been one that's been marked by increased wonder. And As I've come to experience the kingdom of God differently, I, it's no longer as a observer or a theorist I'm experiencing I'm living inside the kingdom of God but I'm doing it as a participant hmm how do I explain this to you how do I how do I explain to you the difference between living inside Christianity and then going into the kingdom I'd compare it to the difference between Googling the Grand Canyon on your computer and actually seeing it with your own eyes. On your computer and on Google, you can learn all kinds of facts that are true, all kinds of data. There's photos and videos and um, all kinds of you know, truthful information. You can learn about the internet. You can learn about the Grand Canyon on the internet, but you will not know its grandness, not unless you actually go there. One must go and stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon to know, to feel its grandness. Or better yet, to descend on one of the trails in order to feel in your chest, in your heart, in your soul, the weight and the awe and the worth and the beauty of the Grand Canyon. So about 20 years ago, that was me. I was, um, I was flying solo on a road trip and decided to take a detour to go check out the Grand Canyon. I had heard about it, not from Google, but I'd heard about it, and so I took a left or a right, I don't know what it was, and went to check it out. And I was not prepared. I was just not prepared for the size and the majesty of what I encountered. I remember being on the edge just thunderstruck by the sheer beauty of it. And uh, so much so that I, I decided that it would be a good idea to hike down and stay the night in the Grand Canyon. Um, so I grabbed two things out of my car, a gallon of water and a sleeping bag. And I went down the trail into the Grand Canyon. Nobody knew where I was at. I didn't fill out the, the ranger paper, paperwork. I was pretty foolish, but I was just drawn like, I gotta go experience this thing. About halfway down in the canyon, um, I was caught by dusk. The sun had gone down and um, I decided to pitch my sleeping bag right there on the ledge. I was looking forward for, to a night, what I thought of like reverent, awesome prayer and thought or something, I don't know. But when the sun set and I was struck by the raw reality that, I, that surrounded me, uh, that I was perched alone in the darkness of the Grand Canyon. Nobody knew where I was at, and the only light was from the stars, which were, there was 
there was so many stars, more than I'd ever seen before. And, and uh, there was a thunderstorm that was rolling along the northern rim and lightning strikes were happening. And that's the only light I had. And I was terrified. My wonder was totally overtaken by terror. I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by the grandness. I remember staying awake all night in like reverent submission to the Grand Canyon, reverent submission to this prehistoric nature that surrounded me. And at the first light of dawn, I grabbed my water, I left my sleeping bag, which was probably confusing for the rangers, but I grabbed my water and I scurried up and out of the canyon, back to the civilization that I, that I knew and I understood. I had stumbled into a reality that was too real, into a truth that was too true, and into a grandness that was too grand. I was unprepared for it. I had encountered the Grand Canyon, and I was changed because of it. So the same is true when we encounter King Jesus and his kingdom. One cannot encounter him without being transformed. He is the absolute reality the visible image of the invisible God. He is the king of glory. Hmm. I wonder what all of this sounds like to you. I've probably lost a lot of you or some of you a long time ago. Maybe because it sounds like a bunch of religious mumbo jumbo. And that's okay. Um, there's a right time in each of our lives when, we're, when we are ready and wanting to hear about God and until that time comes you can't pretend you can't you can't pretend to be interested without being dishonest and that's that's no way to approach God but my greater concern my greater concern is for the majority of you that you are hearing what I'm saying but you're hearing it in a, in a way that doesn't challenge your worldview it doesn't challenge it, you're not you're hearing me but you're not hearing me like, like you're saying, oh, I get it. Drake is just saying that Christianity is true. But that makes it sound all dull and academic and intellectual and institutional, as if I'm trying to make an argument from my experiences to prove by hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that Christianity is true. But that's, that's not at all what I'm trying to communicate. I'm, I'm more like a man who's gone through the back of the wardrobe and discovered Narnia. And I'm coming back to tell you, hey, Narnia is real. As on the lion, he's the king. And all the stories are true. But it's better than Narnia. It's, it's the kingdom of God. It's the King Jesus. And Jesus, he is alive. He is, he is alive. I'm not telling you this from behind steepled fingers in my library of knowledge and trying to prove the doctrines. I'm coming to you wide-eyed and windswept and kind of fumbling a little bit, stunned from glimpses that I've had into this realm that is truer than the reality we think we know. And here's, here's the risk to our souls. Here's the risk to our souls. That we, that you would settle for Christianity. At least the, the version of Christianity that you've learned, unfortunately, from my generation. The one that has just enough Jesus in it to make you grow up and be a nice guy. A nice person. A person who occasionally will post an Instagram Bible verse or a person who pays taxes but really who that who the hell who the hell wants to grow up and like just be a nice guy nice person what little boy says when I grow up I want to be a nice person have a nice house and have a nice lawnmower and a nice car like aren't, aren't we made for more than that don't you and I don't we deeply desire to be to be men and women who play an important role in some grand epic narrative that that really matters 
Don't we desire to belong to something or to someone? In some way, don't we really want to do something or be something risky and brave and courageous and loving? And it may cost us our lives, but at least we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we will have really lived. Isn't that a life worth living? Surely the deepest caverns of the human heart were created to hold something much more noble than, and much more meaningful than merely a life of comfort and ease and suburbia. The call of the kingdom, indeed the call of the king himself, is a call to wake up. It's called to wake up and to live with our eyes wide open to the truth. His call is not to safety. It's not, it's not to comfort and ease. It's not perhaps to suburbia. It's to adventure. It's to risk. It's to himself. For the person who tries to keep their life, they will lose it. But the one who loses his life in honor of the king He's the one that will find it. Jesus Christ is the only one who can tell you who you truly are. Do you hear what I just said? Jesus Christ is the only one who can tell you who you truly are. And not just your name or a biblically generic phrase like God doesn't look at me and say, there's Drake, one of my children. No, I believe that he calls me. He calls me a playful tender-hearted mountain mover. Indeed, he calls me his playful, tender-hearted mountain mover. And he tells me that I'm destined to be a rock in the desert, providing shade for weary travelers on their journeys. And I'm not waxing poetic here. I'm telling you, I'm telling you who God has told me that I am. I'm trusting you with, trusting you with both my my God-given identity and destiny within the kingdom. Like, do you hear what I'm saying? Are you, are you listening? I am somebody within the kingdom because the king himself has named me. Not because I'm special, but because he is glorious. And neither suffering, nor infirmity, nor death, nor paralysis, nor hell itself can undo the true words of the true king. And oh, how it tries. Whew. Every day, every day I'm pounded with wave after wave after wave of reality that tries to unmake me, tries to, tries to unmake me. I'm hit when I wake up in the morning and I can't sit up on my own without help from Bessie. I'm hit by another wave when I can't stand up on my own. I'm hit again when I can't walk on my own or use my hands or scratch my face or feed myself. Wave after wave after wave just being pounded by waves of reality all day long. But let me tell you this, those waves, they break upon the rock of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is the truth. So even though I have fallen from the high dive and towards what appears to be an empty pool, I believe my Father's voice, even now, because His words are truer than the reality of the concrete below. His words created the entire universe. His words sustain my spirit and my soul and my body. And what He's been saying to me for the last 17 months, in the midst of my suffering and in the midst of my descent into disability, is a woven tapestry of promise that declares, that declares this, though I will see many troubles and calamities, he will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, he will raise me up again, increase my greatness and comfort me again. He will rescue me and honor me. He will satisfy me with long life. And I will know the salvation of the Lord in the land of the living. He has torn me, the Lord has torn me, so that he may heal me. He has struck me down, but he will bind me up. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living, for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ 
is mine. Hmm. People ask me, in the light of my declining physical health, if I still believe that God will heal me. But why shouldn't I? Is anything impossible for him? And he is not a man that he should lie. But let me tell you a deeper secret. He is healing me. And even death cannot kill me. I have become a prisoner of hope because I believe him. I'm not saying that I just believe in God. Believing in God is good. I'm saying I believe God. I believe and trust the words he has spoken. And the ways of reality, they can pound me with all their vengeance. They will not and they cannot break the rock of Jesus Christ who is within me and to whom I belong. So why am I telling you all of this? Your generation. Because I want you to wake up. I want you to wake up and see it and know it for yourself. Now. Now as a young person. Now as a teenager. What I'm discovering through hardship is equally available to you if you will have the courage to surrender and to seek. Surrender what, you may ask? Everything. Yourself, your heart, your false identity, your fears, your hopes, your comfort, your ease, your self-righteousness, your talent, your right answers. Surrender all of it and seek first the kingdom of God. If you risk everything and gain Jesus Christ, you will have lost nothing. Most of you, unfortunately, will venture into the land of Christianity, the land that my generation has given you, and you will either reject it or you'll get bogged down in it. Your feet will get mired in man-made doctrines or cultural norms. But if you, if some of you have the courage and the resolve by God's grace to push through and go beyond, you will break through the back of the wardrobe into the Narnia your heart was made for. You will descend into the grandness of the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon of God's love and return to civilization with a story to tell. You will have something to give. You will jump from the high dive and live bold, risky and lives, lives marked by sacrificial love and uncommon virtue. Those around you in the world will not understand. You will be under, misunderstood. Indeed, they cannot understand. They will mock you. They will scoff you. They may even crucify you, but they will regard you. A person who lives in the kingdom of God while on earth cannot be ignored. He or she is a supernatural force who will bend reality with the weight of truth. You will do this. And not because you are heroic or not because you have your strength or wisdom or wit or charm. Not because of your talent or intelligence. But through the infinite strength, infinite goodness, and infinite wisdom of the Divine King, whose Father is God Almighty, and whose Spirit lives and breathes within you. I want to close with, an, with an, a second letter. You recall earlier I showed you the letter I had written um, to God nearly one year before I became sick. It was my crisis of faith, a cry from my heart. My confession was that I was living a fraud. <clears throat> and it was a desperate plea for mercy. And then two weeks later, I received a letter in return from, <laughs> yeah, from God. Not in the mail, but in my soul. So inspired by his scripture and led by his spirit, I wrote the following words. Dear Drake, 
I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and I will redeem you so that the Father may be glorified. I am, and I will make you strong in faith and bring you to the glory I have promised. I am, and I will scatter the darkness in your heart, and the light of my glory will shine in you and fill you with radiance and joy and peace and faith on your journey home. I am, and I will grow a garden in your barren soul, and with my rain and by my sunshine and by my word, you will be fruitful. I am, and I will recreate you in my own image and present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before the Father. I am, and you, Drake, you will one day be with me where I am, in a city that has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God is, is its light. You will see that my blood is greater than sin and mightier than hell and worthy of your love and allegiance forever. I am, and I promise that I will. Therefore, awake, O sleeper, arise, and incline your ear to me, to my voice. Do you hear me beckoning you? I'm calling your name today. Come to me, believe in me, abide in me. I am the one that made you. I am the one that loves you. Come and see, come to me. I am he, and you know my name, and I know yours. So Winfield, this is my hope and my prayer for you, that you too will wake up. You'll wake up, wake up, and come to know the true King's name, and that he in turn, in his love for you, in his grace for you, in his mercy towards you, in his goodness for you, that he will tell you your true name, that you may know your identity and your destiny within the kingdom of God, and that you may live it with courage and with joy, his holy kingdom, the holy kingdom of Jesus Christ is marked by love and it will prevail for eternity and God willing you and I will be alive in the aliveness of God both now and forever for to live to live is Christ and to die to die is gain Winfield I love you Thank you for loving me through this journey. My prayers are with you. Um, you're welcome to come and sit next, sit with me next to this fire pit if you ever want to have a further conversation. But God bless you. And go Lions. <laughs>